Um, I think these two need very little introduction, but you know, we have here Aiden Senkut of, of Felicis Ventures and Rebecca Lynn of Canvas Ventures. Um, so we're going to talk about a lot of good stuff, um, but I guess before we look into the, you know, the crystal ball and um, talk about what's to come, I kind of want to take a time machine back and, you know, probably everyone was asking you this very question this time last year about what are you going to expect in 2017? Um, and of course, everyone wants to pat themselves on the back when they are right, but I'd want to turn the tables and say, what was something that you expected to happen this year that didn't really happen or that you got wrong? I mean, I'll start. I think a wise man once said, I know that I'm probably going to get half of the things right, half of the things wrong. The key thing is to know which, which half is which. <laughs> so um, I, I think our assumption, whenever we look at the data, um, half of the investments we made and half of the predictions we made are pretty uncanny, but they're always surprises. In fact, Mark mentioned uh, Nassim Taleb, uh, Black Swan. Our whole firm strategy is built on another one of the concepts that uh, he put forward, uh, anti-fragile. And so I think for me, the thing was not like we expected something and a different thing happened, but how many new things happened we didn't expect. So for instance, uh, I invested in a mental health company, a drone detection company, uh, a managed 401k company, uh, and a commerce infrastructure company. If you ask me, I would have never predicted I would do that. So th there were a lot of surprises. Um, I don't think we would have predicted that Bitcoin is going to hit 11,000. Uh, I, I will confess, ICOs, like, we were not very early, and we're still kind of coming to terms with that innovation. I think it's going to be important. Um, so a lot of things happening, and things are happening a lot faster than expected. Um, also, we try to avoid making predictions, because predictions, like, it's almost like 100% guaranteed that, you know, like, if you're lucky, some of them will come true. But the bigger thing, not just for investors, but for the founders and LPs in the room, is how much margin for error are you giving yourself to be able to withstand those black swans and the things that are changing? So the things that you can control in terms of increasing your margin for error, you're ready for it. But for us, the thing was like, I think 2017 had more surprises than usual compared to all the other years we've been active. And for me, so I, I love the, the David Morgan Taylor used to say all he has to do in his career, or all he had to do in his career was get one more thing right than wrong, right? And so as entrepreneurs and investors, you see this a lot. And, and for us, I think, I think a lot of investors are kind of looking for where that winter is. Where is the correction, right? And, and, it, and it, it sort of was a, was a thaw, maybe, like, as Mark had said, but it, it wasn't really a correction. And you look ahead, and I don't disagree. It's probably actually one of the best presentations I have seen ever in the industry. So I think we just hats off to Mark, right? That was amazing. And, and I think a lot of the investors are kind of looking, saying, okay, where's the correction? Every seven to nine years, you know, we expect this. And we haven't seen it. And you look ahead, and so many exciting things are happening with autonomous driving and the drones and AI and VR. And you're like, oh, you know, here we go. <laughs> you know, you don't you really get a break. You're in it for the second round already, right? And so I think for us, it's incredibly exciting. And unless there's a black swan event, which we have had in the past, and I've seen a couple, um, where I think it's going to continue to accelerate. So I guess I'll, I'll frame this um, to be a little bit less about predictions, although I think that's what a lot of the room, of course, wants to hear because, um, because you have a lot of insights. Leave the predictions you. to Mark's sister. Yeah, yeah. Um, but looking into 2018, where are you actively leaning into or leaning away from, whether it's certain sectors or even, um, you know, kind of looking at broader society, because clearly there are a lot of problems in the world. Uh, maybe there are certain, uh, you know, customers that, customer demographics you're paying particularly close attention to. Uh, I'll take a quick shot. There has been something we've been exciting for the last five years, and we like the fact the rest of the industry is catching up. When Facebook went public, they called all the Google people, including myself, is like, oh, like, what's the next Facebook? People forget the next Microsoft wasn't Microsoft, it was Google. The next, like, Google wasn't Google, it was Facebook. Uh, the big prediction that I have, I will make only one prediction, is that I expect health to become a lot more important. People forget that, you know, a lot of us, um, even though we'd like to see a lot of progress, we're still 
fighting cancer and HIV and other things, not to mention my big thing, we are really focused on what we call Health 2050. So there are areas like mental health, which I think affect 80% of all global population, but is not diagnosed. You can't go to a doctor and do an annual checkup. When you go to a psychiatrist, like they just do some rudimentary tests, but like people have schizophrenia, depression, a lot of other things. So we're very excited about mental health. We already made our first investment. We expect that to be really important. We're looking into any other areas too. Areas we're less excited about that we don't think there's gonna be a big kind of like boost is um, kind of consumer social. I think that game is done. Uh, marketing tech, ad tech, I think those are pretty much mostly taken out between Facebook and Google. I feel like a lot of the you know, major areas in consumer, the oxygen is taken out of the market. So I, I totally agree with you 110% on ad tech, marketing tech. I disagree 100% on health. So I've been, I've been in healthcare since 09, and I'd love to be proven wrong, to be honest, because I passionately want this to be true. But we've been investing in healthcare since 09, at a time when really the only other venture firm was looking at it was Venrock and NMDV at the time. And we've done a number of deals in healthcare. And I also do fintech pretty heavily. And you know, all my fintech deals have exited fairly well. The healthcare deals have done well, but it's a little bit longer, it's harder. We haven't seen those big exits. So I would love to see, especially the mental health realm, um, take off. And I'm excited about the ones in my portfolio, but it's just harder. And the problem and the reason it's harder is the way we're paying for it, right? That consumers actually don't pay for it. And so I do fintech and I do healthcare and people don't balance their checkbook and they don't take care of themselves and when they're not paying for it, they don't feel it. And so I would love to see healthcare take off, but I've got to say I think for most investors we've got to see some outcomes there before we really sort of double back down on that sector. But I do think, um, I do think um, machine learning and AI it, it's time, and we've seen some amazing applications lately. We were very early and serious. I really believe in that voice application, but now video and imaging and all of that, I think especially as we look at the security space is incredibly interesting, and it's time given the, the processing power and the database inputs and things like that that we can actually realize that. Uh, I'm happy to take a public bet on health, but there is one <laughs> important fact because we just had our annual meeting a couple weeks ago. Um, the three largest sectors in public markets, people might or might not realize, one of them is related to our common investments. But it went from 10% in 40 years to 60% of public market. It's health, fintech, uh, and IT. Um, so the way we approach AI, everybody's kind of thinking there's like a magical AI company. We think AI as an enhancing layer. So we call it AI enhanced IT. So all of our capital is flowing into these three major areas in terms of core areas, fintech, health, AI enhanced IT. So on the AI side, I will agree, but on the health side, you just need to look at public markets. Other than technology, health is like the other uh, kind of large creation of money and I, I think there will be more to come there and I'm happy to be no, uh, on and, record. And, and it's 22% of our GDP, but it's still totally dysfunctional. And interestingly, I mean, you both mentioned fintech and, and healthcare, digital health, and as I think we all know, there's certainly a lot of challenges and a lot of reg heavily regulation, you know, heavily regulated. And I guess with the, you know, the, the current administration, what we expect for next year, how do you see that maybe changing both those industries as well as your your view on companies going after those spaces or anything within those spaces that you... Well, in healthcare especially, um, there has been just a cooling as people are trying to just figure out what's going on and what's next and how is it... And it really, who's going to pay for it, right? I mean, that, that is always the question is just who's going to pay for it. And things can work better and behave better and, and, and all of those things, but unless they figure out who pays for it, it's really hard. And, and in mental health especially, I mean, we've looked consistently at that space, and the question is who's going to pay for it, right? But there have been some good companies. I mean, there is like talk space is sort of taking off right now, but they're, I think, pivoting into corporate. We've seen a lot of those healthcare companies try to sell to employers now as well, and so that's getting more crowded. Um, but I think there's a lot, like by companies that are selling into hospitals, there really has been a pause about, you know, in this whole thing of like, well, what's going to happen? What are we going to be made to do, right? And who's going to pay for it? And so I think the administration is causing some issues there in that space. And then in fintech, we'll see, right? I don't think it's administration as much. I think it's, I think ICOs are, are absolutely going to be regulated. I was in Lending Club and there was Prosper at the time, right? And how many of you guys remember those companies, right? It sounded a little similar. Disintermediation of banking, cutting out the middlemen. We don't have to be registered. We're not a security. Guess what? You're a security. You got to be registered. <laughs> and uh, and Prosper got a massive class action lawsuit thrown on top of it, which really hurt the company very severely for a long time. So, I do think 
Um, I do think it's not really the administration so much, just the SEC is going to be the SEC and it's a security. And so, um, so that's gonna sort of shake out over time as well. So I will add two things. Number one, I think the most important thing is there are moments when there is a perfect time and a unique insight for success to happen. So one of the things we're noticing in health, so we made four or five very unusual investments in health. All, almost all of them, I'm not gonna specify which area. Within the last 12 months, there are a lot of things that are now reimbursable that was not. So what's gonna happen is five years from now, some of these areas will be hot and we're gonna look back and I just wanna be on the record, it might take five, it might take 10. But we will or see, 50. definitely. <laughs> We will see. I'm, I'm willing to be on the record on this, but we will, we will see that there are some major areas that are going to be really big. And like to Mark's point of like um, sovereign wealth company, uh, money coming, we're in a company called Garden Health. They could biopsy like that alone immediately, like it got $300 million infusion. That company is now not going away. What was interesting is when we talked to Tomasek and SoftBank uh, and Mubada and all of these uh, firms that have invested in our companies, they see kind of capital as kingmaker. Once you get that kind of capital, it's almost impossible to run out of money, which gives you almost unlimited life. So if you're playing a computer game, imagine you crack that code and now you like, don't have three lives, you have like a thousand lives. So it's kind of an interesting way to showcase it. And on finance, um, we've, Rebecca and I have both been very, very um, focused on that area. The thing that's surprising me, every time I make a big investment, I think this is it. There is no possible way of finding another company. Like we invested in Credit Karma. I'm like, there is going to be nothing more important than consumer credit, than Adyen and payments. I'm like, there is nothing more important than payments. Then we discovered managed 401k space, which is trillions of dollars. Only Fidelity and one other company uh, manages it. Everybody focuses on personal retirement plans, but nobody thinks about managed corporate retirement plans, which is a cluster F because I'm also a small business owner. Trust me, like I'm dealing with this kind of stuff and I need to support my team. Um, so lots of interesting areas. So what I will tell you is it's always those unsexy areas. And if you're willing to do the homework, if you're willing to spend the time and look closer, those gems will present themselves. And we're only a $200 million fund. So for us to be successful in health, all it takes is one or two big companies. And I'm pretty sure we're going to get that. Yeah. So shifting gears slightly, we talked a lot about different sectors and whatnot. How much are, I guess, for each of you and your funds, um, your firms um, looking at uh, certain geographies or investing you know, outside of, outside of the Silicon Valley or let alone the uh, U.S.? So, so we're incredibly thesis driven. You know, we have a thesis and we dive very deeply and at times that company will not be in the Bay Area, right? So we have companies in New York, we have companies, you know, up and down kind of the coast as well. And and but it's more of a thesis approach. I don't we also have a company in the UK, but that actually came out of an incredibly concerted effort with the thesis where the company just happened to be there and that was the right company for us. But and you take a different approach, right? You kind of go all over. Yeah, so let me, so I think if there is one other thing we can say on the record, even from 10 years ago, the only way I could make it into Google was like speaking languages and with Google I went to 40 different countries. So from the get-go, we basically said, there are no multiple universes of companies, there is one universe of great companies. I will only include China and India, they are truly like in, you know, universes by themselves, but for the most part, every other geography, there is no such thing as like you know, American unicorn, Canadian unicorn, there is one world of like great companies, and I will call them billion dollar plus companies, so our thesis was, we need to be where the companies are, like our first IPO was Canadian, and it was started in Ottawa. Five of the most famous venture capital firms told the founder that there is no way he can have a public company that can succeed unless he comes to Menlo Park. That company is worth $11 billion. Our fastest growing company is in Australia, and people said a boyfriend, girlfriend can run a company together with no board. You know, there is not enough governance. It's not going to succeed. Fastest growing company by leaps and bounds. Our most valuable company is a Dutch company. Honestly, I'm almost embarrassed to say that, but it is probably the most homogenic company I've ever invested in. Uh, but it is the best performing company, the most profitable. So for every argument that you can make, there is always a counter extreme example. But the reason why I'm saying it is like, we didn't come out and say, and by the way, we had an IPO in Helsinki and one of my friends came up and said, you might be one of the few Sandhill firms that like celebrated an IPO in Helsinki, which, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it's like crazy, might be the only one. But so I think the whole point of 
explaining this is we didn't come out and say, we're going to have like a Finnish arm, we're going to have a Canadian arm, we're going to have an Australian arm, we're going to have a Dutch arm. We said, we're one little firm. We just have a lot of hustle and humility and kind of this immigrant chip on the shoulder. We're going to find companies wherever they are and we're going to make it work. And clearly, like this is showing that the international strategy is important. I will make a really interesting point, though, to Mark Suster and his data. So we have had one solid observation, which is, in this latest fund we're investing in the last two years, there is a tremendous amount of companies that have a leg in Silicon Valley or headquarters here, but they have operations and engineer outside of here. So for instance, we have one company that does a lot of middleware and their key engineers are in Romania and Czech Republic. We have another one where the key engineers are in radio frequency. It's in the middle of nowhere, like in Germany. Um, and we have more companies like that. And all these companies are telling us something interesting. The cost advantage was like one to two, one to three. Now the minimum cost is advantage is one to five. If you're in an office in Canada with Canadian government incentives, you ask about regulation, we should definitely take a page from their book, it's one to 10. So their engineers are costing them one tenth of what it would cost in Silicon Valley, not to mention you can't find these people in Silicon Valley. So the, the point that I want to make is international is not just making some investment in a country, that's not it, but it's also understanding how our landscape has drastically changed and it's a matter of survival now. So you need to find, like we just talked to another company yesterday, completely like, you know, random, like middle of the field thing. And the first thing the founder said is, I can't hire people here, so I put an office in Vancouver. And you know how creative it is? He's like, I don't care about Trump. The fastest way of getting employees to US, you hire them in Vancouver and through the Canadian US visa program, you can get them in here in six weeks. So entrepreneurs are very creative. We just don't have to like, we have to remove the blocks in front of them. But we have seen international play a bigger and bigger role uh, from what we can see. And can I just add, so, and, and it's not just a cost thing, as I was saying, it is talent. I mean, the talent is amazing. So my number one favorite university out there for engineering talent is University of Illinois. And if you look at it, it's Levchin, it's Siebel, it's, I mean, it's, it's the Andreessen, it's the whole, I mean, almost everyone out here that's like a major tech giant, it's University of Illinois, U of I, right? And I'm from the Midwest. How many else, anyone else here from the Midwest? Yeah, so I'm, I'm very proud of that fact. You know what, number two is it's Waterloo, right? In terms of amazing tech talent. And then I'm, I'm Berkeley, so Ber then you have Berkeley and Stanford. Yeah, there you are. And so, but when you look at this, it's not, a, I mean, I just want to stress, I mean, almost all of our countries have these, you know, dev resources not he, uh, necessarily all here, but there's amazing tech talent out there that don't live here or didn't maybe go to school here. And, um, and, and it's getting our companies to be creative about how to do that because not everyone wants to live out here. Not everyone can afford to live out here. And so it's not just a question of cost, right? It's really a question of, of where, um, where we're trying to optimize those resources. And that international fr front is incredibly interesting. And there's a number of our companies with Israeli, you know, dev offices and things like that, so. And that's a nice um, seg segue into the next question, which um, still kind of focused on 2018. But um, you know, we you talked a lot about you know the the, the amazing talent that's everywhere. It's not just here. Clearly, um, it's a uh, you know it's it's universal. Um, and I mentioned this morning that you know VCs ideally really shouldn't be limited by um, that a founder has to be a certain. Uh, nationality, certain gender, certain type of founder. I'm sure everyone has kind of the joking, stereotypical founder that they think of. Um, and clearly, you know, I mentioned also this has been a really transformational year in VC. Um, you can be optimistic or pessimistic about the changes, but um, you know, as it relates to diversity and inclusion, everything you know you both have seen happening. Are you optimistic that we're actually seeing real change? And like, how are you seeing what might happen in 2018 in terms of? Will that hopefully lead to you know more funding for um, you know diverse founders, diverse businesses, or? Yeah. I, I have some comments, but go ahead. Are you, are you sure? okay, cool. <laughs> so so it's interesting. I mean, all these comments that are kind of made, and like the people that are some of the people being called out. You're like, I just didn't think anyone cared right before because all that stuff was fairly known right for years, and now all of a sudden people care, and it's really nice. I think it's a good positive uh, positive change. But for me, like I haven't, I guess I haven't looked at. I don't. I don't consider that as much. I always look for in my founder, like what's driving them? Like what's the chip on their shoulder, right? What is what is it about their background or about where they came from or about their story that gets them out of bed every day and when things aren't going so well, like drives them to just keep going and what is it they're trying to prove? And so I've always looked at that particular aspect, no matter what the nationality or gender or whatever, it's just like what is it about their story and their vision and their purpose 
that drives them. And I could tell you for every one of my uh, guys and gals like what that is. And I think that's incredibly important to understand about your founder and as a CEO, it's also incredibly important to understand about your team. Like why, why are they there? Why are they signing up to do a startup? Why, why are they willing to put in the extra days and hours and long, and long, and, and long weekends as well? And, and understanding that. So I think on the, diver on the diversity front, I, I'm glad it's getting attention. We're, we're being very helpful. There's a, you know, a group of female VCs that, are, that I'm part of that we're really you know, pushing, trying to encourage people to consider diversity and, and put that high on their, high on their agenda. And, and in terms of me personally, I, just, I think it's always been how I've operated. So. Yeah, I mean, I want to add a couple things. Number one, um, I, I really respect that, and I'm glad that things are changing. To me, like one of the things that I have seen, so I was very early at Google, and diversity was a key part of Google's success. It was in the DNA. So what I tell people always is that if diversity and inclusion is one of those things where bad things are happening, somebody slaps your hand, and you have to change behavior and say, now I'm going to change my behavior, I'm not really sure like that's really going to lead to like and it is important to create the awareness and I will talk about it but for us diversity is only interesting if it's successful like it needs to be successful so we're still running this experiment we were like I think like two years in a row, the number two most diverse VC fund. I want us to be successful. People can say, you know what? I inspire to be diverse because it's a key tool to be successful. In the same way, like the Australian company I mentioned, I want that the company to be successful because it's led by uh, an amazing woman. Stitch Fix went public. You know, I always told people, like I interviewed the same time as Marissa Meyer at Google, people always thought either you can be a CEO or you're on the cover of Vogue. Very few people are a CEO and are on the cover of Vogue. So we need to break these barriers and taboos and so I will tell you that one thing that has been eye-opening for me we've done unconscious bias training we started changing like the way we make decisions and honestly there's been another survey where I think on a per partner or capita basis we're the number two VC firm of backing women and I we have still a lot more to do but one of the reasons I mentioned health we are very interested in frontier, like bleeding tech stuff. And when I look at companies that are growing bones, growing organs, like fixing people, extending longevity, mental health, guess what? 99% women, founders and CEOs, you don't even have to look hard. Everyone is women. I, I haven't found a single male founder but, and CEO. That, that's always been true of the life sciences space yeah. and of, even of life sciences VCs. I mean, they're almost like 30, 40%. Yeah, so the, the point is we are not doing it as like a force percentage um, but it is really important. And the last thing that I will mention is just to appreciate the difference. For instance, we have noticed that we are very eagerly looking for people to join our team, especially women. But we noticed that, you know, like women and men like present things differently. Or we notice it with founders too. And being aware of it and giving people the right space and kind of like understanding those differences and not like running into, you know, immediate conclusions and rushing into decisions, it's been really helpful. And I'm not saying that we don't have still more homework to do. I think we have a ton more homework to do but one of our core values is learning and adapting rapidly so all these things that have happened we're also still taking it and saying we can still do better what else can we improve and what else can we change and, and, and I think what women like your, your company in Australia, right? Women putting numbers on the board, Stitch Fix, House. I mean, these are all women-led companies. And my favorite company in the world, Epic, led by Judy Faulkner, which is a healthcare company, to your point, and a $6 billion entity. I mean, she owns it all, and she's amazing. And I have to give Christine and Rebecca huge kudos because, look, we need to have more women in the Midas list, right? Like, we need women to be inspired. I can be a VC. I can be an investor. And I can be really successful and kick butt and, you know, just uh, be out there in the upper echelon. And thank you for being great role models and you know setting this um, so uh, touching a bit on founders since both of you clearly have seen a lot of founders over the you know past decade or longer and a lot of deals um, and you also have the unique insight that probably a lot of people in this room don't yet have seeing you know betting on founders unproven all the way to an IPO or, or you know unicorn status or whatnot, um, but you know hindsight's always twenty twenty, of course. But I guess at this point, you must have some sense of kind of key qualities of what you see in a founder that you know gives them a higher likelihood for success. Um, and what what is that? Um, so I will mention three things that I I think is pretty uniform. Uh, the number one quality is grit. So the interesting thing is we have made. Uh, over 250 investments, and 80 of them have been acquired and four went public 
Rebecca has been in the industry longer than I have, but one thing that I have seen across all the different sectors, all the different stages, like exits from tens of millions to billions of dollars, uh, interestingly enough, there is more commonality among the top founders, and that is they just won't take no for an answer. They have incredible resilience. So there is kind of this image, by the way, like for me, like the thing that opened my eye, when I was an angel investor, like Mark just mentioned, like I was just writing checks because I just done well at Google, and you know, if you have surplus capital, writing a check is not that difficult. But the first time I had to raise money myself and I had 40 no's, I really appreciated what the founders go through, and I think I was on the 109th version of my deck, and that's when it dawned on me that, you know what, now I can be up here and like talk about great stuff, but trust me, like I faced that adversity, and there were many times I went home and I told my wife, I don't know, maybe I should give up, and I didn't. And so the number one thing is grit. The second thing is something we call visualizing success. Now, I know that everybody like thinks about plans and plans change, but if you do not visualize success, you're just not gonna get there. So like we had this famous thing, like I used to work for Larry and he used to scare the hell out of me because he used to ask for things that I'm like, that's impossible, that's impossible. He's like, yeah, because if I ask you to go to Mars and you fail short, you're gonna land on the moon. It's still better than going from here to Kansas. So like I'm gonna ask you for crazy stuff and even if you're 50%, you're still gonna be much further ahead. So this is another aspect of the mental, this is a mental game. A lot of our limitations are mental. You know, like when you go to the gym, I can't do it, and some trainer comes in, next thing you know, you're doing like 100 crunches or whatever, like, take it like, I can't do this, like, I can't do the diet, and somebody inspires you, and next thing you know, like, you're doing it. So it's just breaking that mental barrier. And that's why I think the very successful people do not have any mental barriers. They've already visualized success, and so even if things change because of that plan, they're gonna relentlessly drive towards that point. And I think um, the third thing is just like a combination of focus and inspiring talent. So the most important thing that I learned from my own experience as well is storytelling. If you're not able to tell a good story, you're not going to be able to get customers, you're not gonna be able to grade people to your team. Without people in your team, you're not gonna succeed. So the number one thing, these people have hired very, very early on, incredible people around them. It could be sometimes executive, sometimes junior people, but you need to be able to tell a good story and you need to be able to um, tell good people from not so good people. So you basically form a world, world class team because even with the best idea, even with laser sharp focus, if you're not able to build an amazing team, you're not gonna succeed. So those, the, those are the three things we learn. I love those three things. I love the visualization piece of it especially. I had one founder that, we it was almost out of cash and we were trying to form I was trying to formulate a plan for them and I was like, here's what we can do and he looked at me is like, Rebecca, you think I might fail? He's like and, and I'm like, No, 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 I don't think you're gonna fail and he, but you could tell that like it never had gone through his head that like everything wasn't going to work out just like he planned, right? And I think that truly is uh, just in, inherent in every founder and I and I love that actually. Um, but in terms of your your three things, I don't disagree. I think those are three amazing things. I think and the question too is how do you get there? Because what happens when you're a startup person and you're starting with just you and maybe a couple people around you and that's it, like how do you get from there to running a public company? How do you make it all the way through? And I think the one thing I have learned and I always get behind from my founders is getting a coach early, early before you need it and get a good one and pay up for it. Just get a really solid person to help get you from A to Z. And don't get like the corporate therapist coach, right? Get get the, co there's a lot of those around. Get the coach that's going to go do 360 reviews, that's going to give you the hard feedback, that's going to teach you how to manage your board, teach you how to, you know, hire people and be your sounding board. And it might be a different coach at different times, but for God's sakes, Jobs had a coach, right? And, and I can't stress that enough. And, and, I, and I have so many CEOs who are like, gosh, it's just really expensive. But guess what? How expensive trying to replace a CEO is? I mean, it's usually catastrophic. And so, so get a coach. Invest in yourself early and, and keep learning because there's so many transitions you have to go through from being like five people to 50 people to 100 people to 500 people to 1,500 people. And, and learning that on the fly is just, you probably maybe could, but why? right? Go get somebody to help you through that process. Join YPO, get support, right? And, and learn as much as you can. And the people that I have seen successfully navigate, you know, three people in a garage to a, a big public entity have done exactly that and, and without fail. I mean, they haven't just thought they could do it on their own. And so I think that is the single biggest thing that I look for. People that reach out for that education that constantly are trying to learn and improve themselves because they will make the whole, make it the whole way. Yeah, that really speaks to, I think, 
uh, we all know when we work with our founders, um, CEOs, it's it's a pretty lonely, uh, lonely path, and it's everything is awesome and we're crushing it, and it's probably one percent of the time true, and the other time it's kind of a mess. And um, so so yeah, that's really good. Um, I have one more question. I'll hold you captive, and it looks like there's some questions here. But you know, you both have scaled venture firms, built out teams, and I guess any um, any unexpected lessons or insights that you would share either to first-time fund managers, GPs, or even just other GPs in the room, non-Midas list GPs. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, Midas list is just, look, we, we, we were both really lucky. I think we worked really hard. I'm not going to read too much into it, but I will tell you that raising outside capital was really challenging, but the thing to me that was probably the most shocking and surprising is the non-investment side of venture capital. A lot of people think this is a glory job, kind of like, oh, like, I just want to be a Hollywood star. I'm going to like, end up in the front of all these magazines and movies. Nobody realizes that. Like, you're going to be in some movie, 16 hours on a set. Like, the director is going to ask you to jump on a freezing lake. And They're not going to feed you're, you. are like, shivering. They're not going to feed you. They're like, sorry, like, we forgot your trailer, and you're going to have to be like in this tent right now. <laughs> but um, so it's like kind of everybody focuses on the glory side, and nobody focuses on the other side. But it's just a really tough industry in the sense that it's very difficult to find people. I think it's very much of an apprenticeship business. Uh, we had to figure out a lot of things on our own and the, you know, the non-investment side of things are not trivial and we had to work really hard to get it right. Um, and um, the other thing I will tell you is that when I see our founders, like one of the things that makes me jealous and also admire our founders, like I go to some board meetings, like every Monday I get a digital dashboard and I'm like, oh my God, I want to have that CEO's job because everything is so black and white and crystal clear. And in our business, we're an exit. Like Rebecca just mentioned, like let's say that today, like you're backing a company on the back of a napkin with two founders. Not only have do they have to visualize success, but you have to go with them on their journey through all the ups and downs for eight to 10 years. How do you manage that kind of a business? Like, oh, and by the way, at least half, if not more of your predictions and like forecasts are gonna be wrong. And so like, it's very, very tough. Like, what do you discuss in the team meeting? Like, it's very tactical. And I'm always thinking like, what can we do like to make it more strategic? And you know, our religion, our obsession is all around how not just the great returns, which anybody can make that pitch, but how to make it more probable and consistent. So we just, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about that. So, so it's very unsettling, as, as Aiden said, when you first start. And there's just, I, I ran it one of the top three online marketing efforts, you know, online for years. And every day, you know, I had my dashboard and we had, we knew what we were booking and we could, you know, turn things on and off. And it was just so fulfilling to know, like, hey, this is the number we have to hit at the end of the month. And it's all hands on deck. Everyone's in it. And, you know, we're going to, we're going to do this. And, and, and venture is fairly lonely, actually. And we kind of often try to make it a team sport. And you can have really great partners around you. But at the end of the day, it's, it's a fairly lonely thing. And I think the, the one thing I would tell somebody coming in is realize that you're a recruiter. You're a salesperson and recruiter. Like 80% of your job, like when I've done something that made a difference, like a huge positive difference in the company, it's finding the person to fix the problem, right? And so spending enough time with that company to say, okay, let me understand what your problem is. Let me get a feel for your culture, right? Because different people could do the same job. It may not fit. And then f helping to find or finding that person, right? And so I look at it and like it or not, like as if you want to, in my opinion, if you want to be really, really good at your job, it's helping build that team, right? Because that team is going to be the one going forward. And when I think about that analogy, you know, being in venture is really going from being a player on the field to being a coach, right? And, and a lot of the job of the coach, yeah, you're sure you're running the plays, but you had to pick the team in the first place if, you know, if, you're, if you're at least in the professional leagues, right? And so putting that team together and knowing that that is your job and you need to spend some really concerted time, energy, and effort on helping your CEO and your team recruit their players is incredibly important. And I think that wasn't clear to me until a couple of years into the job. And I think the faster you focus on that and get good at it and get your arsenal of favorite recruiters kind of lined up, the better you're going to be. Yeah. I know like probably a lot of VCs will say this. I don't know how you feel. I mean, at this point it might be different, but clearly like one of the hardest things is also you don't know how well you're doing and you won't know for a long time. So until then you kind of pick up on, you know, some early signals like your portfolio is getting markups or this and that. But yeah, all in all, it's, uh, I know it's hard to pity VCs too much, <laughs> but um, it is hard. So well, and, and the hardest thing is don't, ma don't fool yourself that luck means you're good at it, right? Yeah. I think that's the hardest thing. And so keep keeping that perspective. Okay. Well, that was, that was lucky, right? 
but that but just you have to keep your head down and keep working but, but i will tell you one thing so i'm reading leonardo da vinci's biography and i'm like 1500 like 15th century florence 21st century silicon valley honestly there are a lot of similarities so the one thing i will say to have this job is a privilege and to be honest with you like I admire the founders we back because they're the ones that are changing the world and creating amazing things. We just have this amazing window that we get to join their journey. So, um. great. So it looks like there's um, some good questions. I'll read them aloud for the for the uh, for the live stream and for the audience. But um, looks like the top voter right now is what aspect that causes an investment company to fail is most difficult for you to predict early on? So I'm going to take a very quick shot at this. I've been like yelled at, getting angry. Like I am super conservative. What I tell my companies is if you think that you need to raise when you have three months, go six months. If it's six, go to 12. If you look at the most successful people in the world, investments, athletes, the number one reason why they're successful and luck seems to find them is because they improve their margin for error. So the number one failure that I see is entrepreneurs cutting it too short. They don't understand, like, if you're driving a car, if it's a gas car, don't run out of gas. If, if it's an electric car, don't run out of electricity, right? Like, that's the number one job that you have as a leader of the company. Like, if you're going, you're going to go and you're going to have chances. So the number one failure is don't run out of money. And don't wait too long. Don't like have crazy hopes that it's going to materialize. That's your number one job. I think the second thing is apply this margin of error concept to pretty much everything else you do. If you think you're going to hire people, hire them sooner. If you think you need to fire people, fire them sooner. If you think you're going to scale and things are going to get, get ahead of it. So the number one thing, like what I have noticed is the mental element. And the reason why another one of our core values is empathy is that because a lot of entrepreneurs are just afraid to talk about the truth. If you have empathy and you can establish trust, let's tackle it from day one. Like, we all want to go to up and to the right, and we all know that it's not true. So what is it preventing us from going there? And let's just work as a team. I mean, Rebecca has mentioned it, but the only way you can work as a team and truly function uh, as a partnership, like the ventures, you know, investors and founders, is not the dark side and the light side. You need to establish trust, and we feel that you can do that with empathy. Uh, and because we've also been true on the other side, we ourselves as entrepreneurs, um, you know, we feel that that has really worked well for us. And, and I can't agree more. I mean, that's so well said. And and, and the, the thing, too, is like this whole, you know, what causes a company to fail that you can't see from the beginning is, is that trust, right? I mean, from the very beginning, our attitude is we, we've made the money moved. We're in the same boat. There's not a boat that you're in and a boat that we're in. Like, we're in the same boat, Right. So let's be just really honest from the very beginning about what the pitfalls are in the company, what your challenges are, and you know, make it the board's responsibility to give us a job, right? And, and, and say, here's what I need help with, right? Don't be afraid to ask for help. And it's hard to predict from the beginning if that's going to be the dynamic, but we work very, very hard to establish the dynamic because then we can do something. When you have no runway and your margin of error is zero and you're like, yeah, I need this to happen and you've got two months of cash, that's really hard to react in. But if you've got that margin and you're really honest and you've got the trust and the board is all working together, it, you're, it's going to work out. Great. Um, I think because of time, I'm going to, and I, I want to pick the question, um, not based on votes, because <laughs> uh, I think the more interesting one is right in the middle. So what is pretty open-ended, I think. It could be anything. Uh, what was the toughest challenge you've ever faced? I mean, I mentioned it on another panel, so I think it's very important in this business to be super humble because, you know, like, we, we can say, oh, like, Midas list, whatever, but the reality is the companies we said no or lost or missed, you know, the market cap of those companies is probably 4x the ones we picked. Now, it turns out that at least the ones we picked was high enough that we can be up here on stage and, like, tell you things that you're willing to listen to, which I really appreciate your time. <laughs> but, I mean, the, the number one thing that I learned is take all those failures and take the energy and turn it into a win. Like, I think my favorite story is, like, again, like, Airbnb, 2008. Brian Chesky is, like, two and a half million. Like, you sure you don't want to put 25,000 bucks? <laughs> Twice! I have the email on my Gmail. It's like going to be framed in my office. And I'm like, wow, that really hurts when that goes up 1,000x. But, you know, I'm like, great. Like, I missed it like three times. But then I'm like, okay, well, if they're going to be successful, they're going to use an international payment company. And I relentlessly chased Adyan, and we were the second investor in Adyan. So, look, failure is going to happen. You're going to get things wrong. The bigger question is, if that's going to happen, what do you do with it? 
right? You can be all like bummed out about it and like, oh man, this like sucks and like go on. Or you can take all that energy and say, you know what, I'm going to still try to translate it into something else and like take the lemon, lemon and make a lemonade, quoting Beyonce, right? <laughs> Does she get credit for that one? <laughs> I'm going to give her the credit because I like her music and I've seen her in Super Bowl, she rocks. That's so, so as somebody once told me, you're, you're rewarded for not what you missed, but what you picked, right? So we're, our anti-portfolio is always going to look better. And Travis Kalanick and I were sitting in my conference room uh, talking our healthcare companies, actually, way back. And like, I think it was like 2010, maybe, or maybe even 09. And he's like, hey, I, we were looking over his investment portfolio, his angel portfolio, which was really impressive. And he's like, there's this company like Uber Cab, and I'm kind of thinking about taking the CEO role over. What would you think of that? Would you be interested? I'm like, nah, I've seen like three of those. <laughs> So, so those things happen, right? And there were three or four that we had seen at that point in time. Um, but in terms of the toughest challenge, you know, when I came into venture, I was incredibly lucky. I can't stress how lucky I was. It was literally right before Lehman crashed. So we raised a $400 million fund. I was just hanging around in the venture firm to figure out how to get them to fund my company I was starting. And then, bam, Lehman crashes. The whole market freezes. And I'm like, wow, this is like a kid to candy store, right? Um, so that, that was incredibly fortunate. So from in the investing new perspective, it was an amazing time to be in the industry. However, at the same time, I was the new kid at the firm. And there were a couple companies that from old portfolios that weren't going to make it. And so they basically said, hey, can you take these over and see what you can do with them, right? And that was hard. And that informs everything I do to this day. Because having to sit with CEOs, and you, I, I was in New York a lot. I was like, I, I was so committed. I almost made myself sick over one of the companies because I was just so committed to trying to help make it work, right? But here we are in 09, and no money is moving. And having to sit with a CEO after you both have just been in it and like tried to you know, make everything you could make possibly think of work and shut that company down, it was the hardest thing I've ever done. And so I think for me, that was probably one of the most informative things to have gone through early in my career because I always, I'm very, very careful about where I invest because I'd never want that to happen again. And so, um, so it's, that was super hard, but it was very, uh, very telling early on, and it was very informative of like what could go wrong, and then looking back at what did go wrong, and these companies had been around for some of them for 10 years before I come in and, and tried to help. So I think it was humbling, and I think it kind of gives me a lot of perspective in terms of you know, where I put money now and how I, how I help the companies at this point in time. So, yeah, definitely experiences when you don't get what you want. Right? <laughs> well, thank you so much to both of you. This was wonderful. But, yep. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you, Christine.